justliberty.org It's good for you and it's good for me Justliberty.org Justliberty.org Hi, this is Amanda Marzullo, and with my co-host Scott Henson, we're Reasonably Suspicious. This month, we begin by turning a suspicious gaze onto LaFors, Texas, a town of fewer than 500 people in the Texas Panhandle, which reportedly has an ordinance on the books forbidding people from drinking more than three sips of alcohol while standing up. Scott, what do you think drove the town to enact this three-sip statute? I think this speaks to the lingering political clout in rural areas of big rocking chair, which is which has long been aligned with a drink while sitting agenda. You know, that that's my guess. <laughs> but then why don't we see this ordinance replicated elsewhere? You know, big rocking chair doesn't wield the kind of clout that it used to. <laughs> Forest, Texas, maybe its last last outpost i'm guessing uh i don't know i mean the, the big <laughs> rocking chair does have a powerful constituency i mean you know old white people old people who like to sit down yeah uh, i mean that's that's a lot it is a lot i agree so. <laughs> i just i was wondering how do you comply with this like it, do you have to sit for a duration of time i think you just sit down and have a drink <laughs> Seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> All right. I, 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 what, but what if you want to stand? I, <laughs> sometimes people like to stand. Mysteries of life. Hello, <laughs> boys and girls, and welcome to the July 2020 episode of Just Liberty's Reasonably Suspicious Podcast, covering Texas criminal justice, politics, and policy. I'm here today with our good friend Mandy Marzullo, who just returned from a trip to California with her dog Grizz and briefly considered not coming back. How are you doing today, man? <laughs> I'm doing okay, although Grizz would like to move back. I don't blame her. It's too hot here and very nice in California. That is true. This month, is police reform possible through the state licensing agency? Auditors find little supervision at the Houston PD Narcotics Division. And y'all get to hear a new jingle Just Liberty's been working on with the Austin Justice Coalition. What are you looking forward to on the podcast today, Mandy? Uh, talking about TCAL, the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. Yeah, that's an oddly compelling topic. I agree. I'm, I'm looking forward to that, too. In our top story, the state agency responsible for regulating Texas police officers, the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, is up for a once every... 12-year review by the Sunset Commission. For the uninitiated, in Texas, once every 12 years, each state agency is reviewed to decide whether it should continue to, to exist, whether reforms are needed, or whether it's, time, whether it's time to abolish the agency altogether. This year, it's T. Cole's turn. Scott, you've been in conversation with the Sunset Commission staff on this topic. Set the table for us. What are they looking at... And are there opportunities for meaningful police reform through this process? You know, I definitely think that there are opportunities for police reform through the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. And so maybe an agency review, stem to stern, is the right moment. And especially after all of the recent protests and the renewed political interest here, maybe this is the right moment to figure out what can be done through the Commission on Law Enforcement. This is an agency that has been completely toothless over mm -hmm. the years. And to give credit where credit's due, their current executive director, a man named Kim Vickers, who used to be with Abilene Police Department, mm -hmm. in my opinion, has done a great job and really has done everything you're able to do with the powers the legislature has given him. Mm. And what that's really done is shown the limits of those <laughs> powers, right? Yeah. So what he's done is demonstrate that even if you use them all as aggressively as you can, you aren't able to do that much. Two-thirds of the licensing agencies in other states allow uh, the decertification of peace officer licenses for misconduct. In Texas... We require that you be convicted of a felony before your your license can be decertified. Yeah, and 
and to kind of give more context for our viewers, it's really hard as a law enforcement officer to be convicted or even charged with anything because we don't require that local DAs recuse themselves. So just being charged is a political process. Law enforcement officers work with local prosecutors all the time. It's inherently harder for them to seek charges against them. And they have qualified immunity for many things that they might otherwise be liable for if they yeah. beat someone up in the course of the job, even if it's deemed excessive. You know, they they, they might still not have liability for that under the, under the law. So there's a lot going on there. And the, the states that, I mean, think about it in terms of your doctor. Um, who also has a medical licensing agency or the, or the dental board that, that governs mm -hmm. dentists uh, or yeah. plumbers. Mm -hmm. You know, you can lose your license for being a bad plumber before you've committed a felony. <laughs> yeah. Right? Same with being a doctor. Same with being a dentist. If, you're, if you go in and you're pulling the wrong tooth out or you're amputating the wrong leg and you're doing it more than once, even if they don't find it's a felony, they're going to take away your license. But with a police officer, that isn't the case. Yeah, and, you know, plumbers don't carry guns, too, right. so it's even... Although some of those big wrenches are kind of <laughs> scary if you really <laughs> wield them with, with malice, but... Yeah. Any... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was thinking about analogizing this agency to the bar because... For yeah. lawyers. For lawyers, um, because the membership is sort of similar in size. You know, there are are roughly somewhere around 100,000 lawyers licensed to practice in the state of Texas, and there's somewhere around 100,000 law enforcement officers. Yeah, I think and it's 80,000 um, cops and another 30,000 or so jailers. Yeah, it's a, but potentially even a larger pool, it, it, you know, depending on how you crunch the numbers. So they're right in the same wheelhouse. Yeah, but, you know, if you look at the flow, ch the organizational chart, on the T-Cole website, they've got just over three dozen employees, somewhere around 40. Yeah. Um, with a few vacancies right now. And the State Bar of Texas has hundreds of employees with a specialized investigational division that looks into attorney misconduct and, you know, a whole industry centered around continuing education for attorneys. It's not, there's a pretty comprehensive staff that deals with attorney training, but on top of that, you've got third parties and organizations like the Texas Defender Service, which I used to be the head of, conducting tr specialized trainings within their topics. So we did a lot of the death penalty representation trainings in Texas and we worked with other agencies and there's you know also a court of criminal appeals slush fund right. for <laughs> criminal defense lawyers and that's in the millions of dollars well there's 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 slush funds for police training too but what there isn't is this sort of center for professionalism and and, and coordination of all that yeah they've got one employee dedicated to the training <laughs> right one, one, one. To the curriculum review that's yeah. right and um you and i had had gone to them after or maybe it was before we did a segment on the forensic hypnosis and talked to them about well your training is based on these weird pseudoscience you yeah. know things that have now been disproven from you know the yeah. area of fmri brain scans and this sort of stuff and so can we get you to revisit your training and this i think was in 2018 and kim vickers replied well sure that'll be fine i have one curriculum coordinator mm -hmm. and here's the list of of tasks that i've assigned this person and it looks like I can fit you in sometime in fall of 2022 unless some emergency arises. <laughs> yeah, no, that was so exactly he, what he said. So he was able, you know, to pencil me in four years later. And it's, you know, unless something comes up. And, of course, every session the legislature assigns them more, more training. Yeah. And so, um, you know, what I told the Sunset Review people 
and I, I will say this about very, very few state agencies, <laughs> is that the Commission on Law Enforcement needs more money, more staff, and more power. Yes. They need more expertise within the agency on their issue area. They are the most stripped-down version of a licensing agency you can imagine. And I also had on the blog suggested a way for them to pay for all this expanded staff they need Mm -hmm. that I should go ahead and bring up. They are perhaps unique among licensing agencies that I've ever seen in that they don't receive a budget line item from the people that they're regulating. Most regulatory bodies that have licensure get Mm -hmm. a licensure fee, and and that is priced to, to cover whatever it costs to to do that regulation that's how the state bar is funded in large part yeah and so that is not true for law enforcement all but a few grants come out of the state general fund and so if you started to charge an annual 50 dollar licensure fee for every police officer in the state that would be an extra four million dollars a year which would double the agency's budget Mm -hmm. and give you the ability to hire all these extra staff you need for curriculum development, for training oversight, to develop some training expertise within the agency, to do all these things, to to develop, to hire lawyers to run a decertification program. There's only one staff lawyer in that whole agency. Yeah. And she's functioning more as a general counsel than anything else, dealing with government relations, than looking into police officer complaints. And you'd have to as the only as the only lawyer, you know, at an agency like that. There are very few agencies I would say you need more staff and more power and, you know, load you up. Mm. But when it comes to police licensing, I think that's exactly the formula that we need. Definitely. Earlier this month, the Austin Justice Coalition released a report analyzing 911 call center data, revealing that officers spent less than one-third of their time responding to criminal activity. The rest gets soaked up with things like traffic management or responding to social concerns like mental health and homelessness. Mandy and I sat down with Selena Shia, the head of Austin's local EMS union, and I asked her what categories of calls she saw in that report that she envisioned could be withdrawn from law enforcement's purview. She had a list. When we have this conversation about reimagining public safety, people primarily think about police, but as you suggest, it really does affect EMS. The first area that I would like to look at, and you know, this is in talking to the police union, in talking to other medics, I think that we can agree that there are some calls that we both go on that we don't need to go on. So for example, we have police go on almost every single overdose call, and that's often because there's an illegal presence potentially there, or there might be safety concerns. I have not experienced many times when I needed um, police presence on an overdose call, and I don't think the police officers really feel like they need to be there, especially now that they're moving forward with decriminalizing low levels of marijuana. So I think we can start by eliminating police presence on certain calls where there is a duplication. Um, Another call type is it is very clear from dispatch which calls are going to involve people experiencing homelessness. So if it is a person laying on a sidewalk, the chance that it is somebody experiencing homelessness is, is pretty high. And I think that if dispatching asks the right questions, you could even get that more precise. And so I think a lot of times police are not necessary on those calls either, um, and paramedics um, in our community health paramedics would be more appropriate. Um, even sending an ambulance to those calls is, is, not, is, is not the best option, especially if they actually don't need anything, they're trying to sleep, and all we're doing is waking them up, or they're just like, well, screw it, I'll go to the hospital and get a sandwich. Um, well, that is generating bills for our community. Um, it is not really what this person needs, and really this person potentially needs intervention from a community health paramedic that can set them up with, you know, finding longer-term access to food or get started on housing 
uh, or on medications. And so I think that there's a lot of overlap where we could reduce police presence in those situations. As far as giving us more, and, and that also goes for mental health as well. And we've been working with Council Member Kitchen as well on, you know, bringing something to the legis to the 2022, um, excuse me, 2021 legislative uh, body and see if we can have our Office of the Medical Director give paramedics the power to do emergency detentions so that um, it's not just police officers. And I think police officers will like that as well. They readily admit that they are not mental health experts. Mandy asked Selena to expand on what new authority paramedics needed in mental health cases. So right now, if we get a call that somebody is suicidal, the police officers will go out. If there's any kind of attempt, medics will go out. Some Very rarely do we not go out. So, you know, in the past months, I've gone to two of them where somebody um, did very superficial cuts, you know, on the inside of the arms. Somebody took a few extra, you know, medication. And so basically because there is um, either an attempt or, you know, there's evidence that this person has left a suicide note or has made phone calls intimating that they're going to commit suicide, then a police officer can say, you do not have the right to refuse to go to the hospital. And in fact, the hospital can hold you for 48 hours. And so the police officer is the one who makes that determination and the police officer is the one that's been given, you know, 40 hours of training um, to make that determination of the uh, lethality of leaving the person um, at home. And so, you know, paramedics on the other hand, we have two years of training um, and we take a whole class on psychiatric emergencies. And so we often, you know, disagree with the police officer's um, opinion, but, you know, you could also have two medics there that will also disagree. So um, there was a bill a few sessions ago that asked for emergency room doctors to be able to hold patients for up to four hours. And that did not pass because Governor Abbott, it passed through the House and the Senate, but Governor Abbott vetoed it because he did not want anybody besides a peace officer taking away somebody's rights. I think that in what's going on right now with the police brutality protests, and and I think there is a space to really rethink how we do things, and I think Governor Abbott would be more open to that. But, you know, it, it kind of remains to be seen. Yeah. It's kind of weird because... Like, if you read a paramedic textbook or if you even look at our medical guidelines, how we operate as paramedics in the field, it actually says that we are not really allowed to let somebody who is suicidal refuse, but we also don't have the power to kidnap them and take them to the hospital. So there is kind of some contradiction in how we're supposed to act and what we have the legal authority to do. So it definitely gets really tricky there, and we usually have to call for the police in order to do an emergency detention. But if we had the ability to do them, then, you know, obviously we wouldn't need to involve the police. Moving police out of the mix in minor situations would also help clarify their role when they are involved. Since the protest, Selena has seen officers begin to withdraw from doing their jobs. She thinks a public health-oriented approach would achieve better results. We're already seeing some downstream effects of the protests. For example, you know, we're seeing that officers are, that, you know, when we need help, um, there are some officers who are, you know, taking to heart these protests and not wanting to go hands-on. And I do with, with patients that, so for example, there was um, one case in a road where a patient was clearly having a psychiatric break and needed to be cleared from the road uh, because there was, you know, high speeds of traffic and the police officers did not want to go hands-on. And I think it, it you know, it, it's an interesting question because we really did need help and this person's safety was at jeopardy, but because of everything that's going on, it, it makes sense. And I, I don't know that we necessarily need a gun in that situation. And if the call text had come out just a little bit differently, we could have also just been sent an ambulance and a fire truck, for example. And then um, the fire truck has, you know, four people that could have also helped us. And we do often have to get physical with patients just to ensure their safety if, you know, they're doing something that's harmful for themselves um, or to other people. Um, and that doesn't mean that there needs to be a gun in that situation. Um, and so we could do it along with the firefighters. And I know that 
a lot of our city council members are, you know, taking seriously some of the ideas about, um, you know, what calls do police, they don't feel like they need to be on and we don't feel like they need to be on too. I, I think there is actually a lot of agreement um, among people that are in the public safety space and also in the activism space. And so if we can really work on what we all agree on, um, I think that's a really good place to start. So, Mandy, tell me what you thought about this report and what Selena had to say. Uh, you know, I think what strikes me the most about this report and Selena's comments is just how many opportunities are out there to create a cost savings while also improving services. You know, she noted that sending an ambulance to a lot of the circumstances where they're just deployed as a matter of cause is creating a huge expense for local taxpayers and doesn't seem to serve any purpose. But just sending out an, you know, a medic sort of right-sizes the response, might make everybody more comfortable and be cheaper. And you also saw that in the report. I think you and Kathy both noted about, you know, the, the traffic squad or, I don't know what, division of ABD where, you know, they're, they're towing people's cars and are very proud of that. But if that's really all they're doing, it, should we have someone with a gun? Like, that, wouldn't it make more sense to have a local mechanic? Right. I always thought the traffic division was doing traffic enforcement. And it turns out the traffic division is putting up cones around accidents and helping move vehicles to get to clear the highway so that you know, <laughs> people can drive, which is great. That needs to get done, absolutely. But that seems more like a public works employee type situation yeah. than somebody with a badge and a gun. Yeah, and, and a mechanic could fix the car. That's right. That's exactly right. Why not send someone who can actually solve the problem instead <laughs> of someone who just delays solving it and you know maximizes expense to the car owner? So yeah, I, I thought that was fascinating. Now, th this report came about because the same two statisticians had written an article in the New York Times, what do police really spend their time on? Yeah. And what they found is that nationally, cops spent 1% or less of their, their calls were on violent crime, and maybe 3% of their time was spent on violent crime. Well, here in Austin, it was like 0.6% of calls, and yeah. less than 3% of, of time was spent on that. And so... You know, when you start talking about rapes and murders and all that, that's a very small proportion mm -hmm. of what police are actually spending their time on. And when you consider all crimes, all the way down to Class C misdemeanor, little petty bits and nothing crimes, it's still about 20% of calls, 21% of calls, mm -hmm. about a third of their time they spend. Two-thirds of the time is on non-criminal activity. And so everything that can get diverted to public health, everything that can get diverted to public works, limits the number of police interactions and lessens the likelihood that that officer pulls out a gun and does something stupid with it. Yeah. Austin Police Chief Brian Manley is a handsome man. But sometimes he appears like a zombie in a B-rated movie. He keeps rising up and slogging forward long after he should be politically dead. The Austin City Council in June unanimously approved a resolution expressing, quote, no confidence in the police chief's leadership, and a majority of city council members have publicly called for his ouster. But so far, Austin City Manager Spencer Gronk has refused to remove him. That's why the Austin Justice Coalition and Just Liberty put together an online video and jingle trying to dislodge the chief from his seemingly intractable perch. Scott wrote the lyrics, John Halsman sang them, Gabe Robes played the guitar and produced it. Let's give it a listen. He looks the part, at least that's true. His silver hair and eyes are blue. Saved Austin from the bomber. That's what the TV said. But now he's a chief and if this part's a pity It didn't take long to most of the city Could tell Brian Manley wasn't over his head No confidence, no confidence, no confidence in you The Austin City Council said to the chief the eyes are blue Not much in love is certain But we know this much is true 
We got more belief in aliens and confidence in you. On June 12th, the Austin City Council unanimously voted to say they have no confidence in Police Chief Brian Manley's leadership, but the city manager still hasn't fired him. Now, the Austin Justice Coalition needs your help. Visionary change can't happen without visionary leaders. Go to austinjustice.org today to take action. Paid for by the Austin Justice Coalition. So, Scott, tell us about this project. This, I guess, in many ways represents an act of desperation <laughs> i you learn something new every day and and this fire brian manley process is is teaching me a lot to me in a council manager form of government where the city manager is hired by the city council mm-hmm. once the city council issues a unanimous no confidence vote Yes. That they all publicly publicly debate and then sign off on. And then when a majority of city council members, I forget if we're up to six or seven, publicly, face-to-face, turn to the city manager and tell him, I think that the city would be better off if Brian Manley weren't the police chief anymore and do all this in public settings. I thought he was toast. I thought that would be enough to oust him and now i don't understand what is required so all i know (laughs) to do is to gin up the public even further and try and amp up the pressure because all of what i thought i knew about the political rules don't seem to apply to this man yeah or spencer crock right like they both don't seem to be making any sense like you would think that Kronk would feel pressure to do what his bosses very much want him to do. Also, why why does he seem to think that Manly is good for the city? I mean, if 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 nothing else, having him in this position at this point is bad for the police department's relationship with the community. Right. And. I- yeah. It's deteriorating trust and they're going to be even more in diminishing returns on APD's effectiveness. So why? And also why does Brian want this job? Right, at this point. At this point. Well, and and you know, I'm definitely hoping that things like teasing him in this song is going to contribute to him not wanting this job. <laughs> I mean, him, him, him resigning might be the the shortest distance to this. You know, I think that to give the most generous interpretation possible about why he's not doing it in terms of like the rumors you hear and what what is being said behind the scenes. Okay. They didn't really take seriously the idea of firing Manley before the George Floyd pro- protest. Uh, he was uh, going to blow us off, I think, and had blown us off. Then that happened, and all of a sudden... A bunch of police chiefs all around the country were fired in Atlanta and Minneapolis and and I forget where else, but there's a whole slew of them. Yeah. A lot of police chiefs fired. And so all of a sudden, the question of where do you find someone you could actually label as progressive in the new era becomes more difficult. And I think that there has been some some concern expressed about, well, are we going to find anybody who's better when every city in the country right now has fired their police chief and they're all looking for a progressive chief because there aren't going to be that many people out there is is the thought. I don't know what I think about that, but that's been said to me a couple of times. Yeah, and I think I I, I go to it it doesn't, we don't need a progressive person. We need someone who sets the tone so that the agency isn't killing citizens. Right. Right. And, and that's, that's where we are. They, they are killing people. Well, I think more than that, though. We are in a situation where the Austin City Council has tried to move the department into a more progressive posture. Yeah, and I, I think that that's good. But um, I guess my point is that we could go just to not killing people and having it be better than what it is now. Like, sure. I mean, what, what we're, if, if it's about you know protecting the public, Manley's failing not only are they failing to protect the public on a regular basis they're they're actually a public safety concern right right the 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 mike ramos video finally came out this week and 
it very clearly shows that Ramos was not threatening the officers' lives, that, that there was no justification whatsoever. It was, it was really an execution. It was remarkable. And terrifying. And terrifying. So, no, I, I, I certainly agree with that. Um, no, I don't understand what the, the, the holdup is. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's maybe they want, I've heard, you know, well, they want to wait until after the budget. But again, why? If the city council has stopped listening to him, then why do you want him to be your spokesperson yeah. during the budget? None of it makes much sense to me. So, like I say, you learn something new every day. And I have learned that I don't know as much as I thought I did about these things. <laughs> well, I hope you make progress soon. <laughs> Next up, it's time for a game, Something, Nothing, or Everything, in which Scott and I rate the relative importance of recent news stories. Recent state-level polling from Progress, Texas, cited in the Austin Chronicle, found that 73% of those surveyed agreed that police brutality is a, quote, somewhat serious or, quote, very serious problem. Similar lopsided majorities feel that police departments should reform their use of force practices and that non-police, other types of workers, should be responding to community issues such as mental health and homelessness. A smaller majority... 53% agrees with the statement, quote, we need to reform the police. Plurality support reallocating police funding to health and homelessness, 46%, and agree that police unions have too much power, 43%, and that police don't need military gear and vehicles, 48%. Large numbers are not sure in all three cases. Scott, tell us, is this something, nothing, or everything? This is something headed toward everything. (laughs) These numbers are remarkable compared to just a few years ago. I was looking back at an internal poll that was, was taken here about three years ago now. And when you look at the level of support for Black Lives Matter, compared to what we're seeing in polls like this and 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 quite a few other national ones this was a texas state level poll it's night and day public opinion has has just absolutely transformed and the only reason i say something headed toward everything is that public opinion is fickle (laughs) and you know who knows whether it survives you know the remainder of the trump administration whether that's nine months or five years or you know, there's there's a lot that can happen to change that. But at the moment, this is all incredibly positive. And I never thought I'd, I'd see it on some of these questions. We're, we're, we're seeing levels of concern about issues that were truly fringe topics a quarter century ago. How about you? Something, nothing, or everything? I, I think I agree with something. I get with a slightly more pessimistic view. Like I do, I agree that it's really exciting, especially to see you know a majority of people agreeing that police brutality is a problem. But you know where we're when you look behind that, sort of the systemic reforms still look like we've got a long way to go with sort of public education about how we need to restructure law enforcement. Right and. You know, some of that is that, you know, people have only really been talking about it for a handful of months, and that's during a pandemic. But, you know, th- I think that's where where we need to focus the conversation, and, and hopefully it'll continue in that path. Right. Well, we talked about this last month, that there wasn't just one bad law or one or two bad things that happened that created mass incarceration and that created racial profiling and mm-hmm. and and police brutality. There were hundreds and hundreds of laws empowering police and promoting prisons and incarceration as solutions over the course of many decades. Yeah. And so it's going to take a decade or more 
to roll all that back. It's not something that you're just going to look up and have one good legislative session and then oh, you know, slap your hands and we're done. <laughs> yeah, no, and you're right. I mean, but, you know, to, to be sort of my pessimistic self, like under the current path, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. You know, we're 90 years away from reversing mass incarceration at the current pace of reform. So hopefully this process is going to accelerate. I just, I guess I'm getting impatient. I don't blame you. I'm, I'm definitely with you there. All right, in Travis County's runoff election on July 14th, Jose Garza defeated incumbent Margaret Moore in overwhelming fashion. Garza ran on an agenda of abolishing money bail, ending prosecution of low-level drug cases, and pulling the Travis County DA's office out of the State Prosecutors Association. Mandy, is this something, nothing, or everything? <laughs> um, I'm going to go with everything, everything local. I mean, this is really exciting um, after being really pessimistic about the last one. You know, prosecutors obviously have a great deal of power, and someone like Jose really has the potential to transform what the Travis County Justice Center looks like and how it operates on a regular basis. If he's more collaborative, on all cases if he's not prosecuting cases that don't make sense to be prosecuted like driving with an invalid license you could see a big change in what it looks like to be a low-income person in texas or in travis county and that's really exciting and then add to that that we have a public defender office that's opening up i think Travis County could go from being one of the worst counties to be charged with a crime in Texas to one of the most just ones. Well, it's definitely the case that compared to all of the other DAs in Texas who have been given that progressive label, Mm. he's really the first one that would merit a progressive label compared to sort of the national players. Yeah. Like compared to a Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, for example. Jose really does have policies that are oh. as progressive as, as, as they suggested, and many of them are you know, implementing things that Krasner wanted to do. But the, deciding you're not going to prosecute these less than a gram drug cases is a very, very big deal. Um, I, I would put this at, at definitely something, and only out of pessimism for politicians implementing their their <laughs> campaign promises uh, would i would i not say everything uh, jose it, if you're listening i'm the one that has faith in you i just want to be on the record with that well i, I always I always wait and see but if jose shows up and does everything that that he suggested or even really two-thirds of it mm. because there's no way he won't show up and find some of the things he said may not have been realistic or may have impediments that, that you don't see until you're the one implementing it and, yeah you know I'll, I'll i'll cut him a little bit of slack there but if if he does two-thirds of it then then he'll easily be the most progressive prosecutor in texas and, and then it really will be everything it really will be sort of the new model for what we want to see in the next next phase yeah because we just didn't see it from the kim hogs and my margaret moore's of the world no no they they're just prosecutors All right. In Houston, the police department finally released a long-awaited audit of their narcotics division in the wake of a botched drug raid in January 2019, in which two homeowners and their dog were killed and four officers were wounded. It turned out the search warrant being executed was based on an informant fabricated by Officer Jared Goines, spurring greater scrutiny. Now the DEA's office has identified more than 160 cases in which Goines' testimony was the sole evidence against a defendant, one of whom turned out to be George Floyd, the man killed by police in Minneapolis, whose death launched global protests in June. This audit demonstrated the lax practices that allowed Goins to fabricate evidence with impunity were entrenched and widespread. Scott, advocates have been trying to get this audit audit released for months. Now that we've seen it, is this something, nothing, or everything? I had been hoping this audit would be everything, but it turned out to only be something, I'm afraid. Mm. That's really just because they, it, it was an audit, it was not an investigation. 
And so what this audit demonstrated is that the lax oversight that allowed Gerald Goins and his partner, Stephen Bryant, to get away with fabricating informants and Mm -hmm. evidence and really just running roughshod over people's civil liberties, those lax methods were absolutely everywhere in the narcotics division. The narcotics division is 175 officers, and it's set up in squads of 8 to 12 officers apiece. Mm -hmm. And so they picked several of those at random and picked a handful of officers who had had allegations of misconduct against them and looked at all their case files. And what they found was no supervisory oversight in large, large numbers of them. And in particular, there was one form that for every case, a sergeant and a lieutenant is supposed to physically sign off to say that everything that was supposed to be done was done in this file and Mm. and everything's kosher and someone else has looked at this. Well, that document was missing in about a third of the files. Um, In many of the files, the auditors found the information was incomplete or didn't support the conclusions that that they'd they'd made, they'd drawn with it. And in general, it was just sloppy and messy and, and, and consistently sloppy and messy. And so while it didn't give us a smoking gun, it didn't identify additional officers who may have fabricated evidence. What it showed us was if there were more officers who fabricated evidence, the oversight systems were so lax that just like Gerald Goins and his partner, they would almost certainly have not been caught. Yeah. I guess my concern is, like, is this nothing in that, you know, it's identifying one one organ of HPD that has a problem while ignoring the f- while ignoring problems that are probably pretty pervasive in HPD. I mean, for supervision to be this lax, I right. find it hard to believe that that's isolated to the narcotics division. That's right. You don't you don't just poorly supervise in one area. You su- poorly supervise in all the areas that you supervise. And so if if HPD management and Art Acevedo are are screwing this up, there's a decent chance that they're screwing up elsewhere. Yeah. And we saw that here in Austin. When Acevedo left, all of a sudden, all the the skeletons started to fall out of the closets and things like the DNA lab (laughs) falling to pieces. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about big, big problems. I mean, the the Austin Crime Lab... um, failed to keep evidence at the proper temperature right it was it it was a disaster yeah so yeah um i have to say uh what this said to me was i would like if if i were in a supervisory position like in on on the city council or or in, in mayor turner's position i would be looking to abolish the narcotics division just straight up i mean what i saw in that audit is an agency that is not salvageable like the really yeah. the only way to go in and make them compliant would be to uh, provide additional layers of supervisory staff that would take other officers off of productive pursuits mm. really just to like cover a lot of paperwork and it's all for these less than a gram cases that we were talking about earlier that probably don't really need to be made anyway yeah i mean for the most part that's evidence of low-grade addiction and you know or whatever it's not a it's not something where law enforcement intervening is really going to solve the problem yeah no that it's a public health problem that's right um yeah no and i i would go as far as to say it sounds like it's time for an overhaul of hpd you know it has its own shootings right um and issues with public safety so why not use this opportunity to fulfill the promises? Like Art Acevedo is pretty vocal about how important it is to be measured in the use of force. So let's take him up on that. Right. And that's an excellent point about the broader management at HPD. Probably part of the reason that I focus in on the narcotics division itself is I had worked years ago. This now happened 20 years ago. The Tulia drug stings Mm. were sort of the launch of the modern criminal justice reform movement in Texas. 
and um, they involved a fellow named Tom Coleman, who was very similar in profile to Gerald Goins. And all of a sudden, there was this long string of potential innocence cases where he was the only testimony against these folks. And many of them, he's, he just straight up set them up, just yeah. lied on them in court and set them up. And we had tried back in 2001 to get a, uh, a law passed requiring corroboration for police officers um, in undercover situations. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get that passed. It was scaled back, and we ended up getting it only for informants, for confidential informants. Mm -hmm. And it turns out most drug cases are made with informants, not cops. And so that still had a pretty big effect. But here, 20 years later, we see the exact same issue come up again. Yeah. So the failure to put in checks and balances 20 years ago just lets the practices flourish. And mm -hmm. 20 years later, you see another huge scandal and blow up at the state's largest narcotics division, maybe second after DPS. And it would be preventable if you would just put in measures like that corroboration requirement. So uh, and and oversight. I mean, it, I think I think I think it's culture more than anything. Like right. I, I've been talking a lot That's with right. Professor Lauren at UT, who specializes in police practices and she made the point that you know sometimes when you enact a standard it fails to change behavior because people just sort of find a new way around it and that it's really important to have to couple changes with training and I think exposure to the harms that that they can create like I think the attitudes of a lot of DAs in our state changed or change when they meet people like Anthony Graves and Michael Morton, who can talk about just how innocent they were, how set up they were, and how their lives and the lives of their families were destroyed. Right. Those innocence cases really did change individual minds on a personal level. Yeah. And I think that narcotics officers maybe need to see that and understand it and be aware of the harm that they could do. Right. But the idea that George Floyd was one of those folks who was <laughs> potentially set up by Gerald Goins. Um, Kim Og mailed him his letter oh to God. an old address in Houston. And so he would never have received it. He would never have gotten the information that that case possibly could have been overturned. But it's so poignant and yeah. so outlandish and ironic. Yeah, there's just so many layers of irony here and... Maybe irony is the wrong word, but yeah, there, it's it, hard to process. It, it is. There's a lot going on. Too much. Doing too much. The Houston Narcotic Division. Now it's time for our rapid fire segment called The Last Hurrah. Mandy, are you ready? Ready to roll. Five years ago this month, Sandra Bland died in, in the Waller County Jail after a DPS trooper arrested her for failure to signal a lane change. Legislation bearing her name passed the legislature, but key provisions like limiting arrests for Class C misdemeanors were stripped from the 2017 Sandra Bland Act. Scott, what are the chances that the bill finally passes in 2021? You know, knock wood, we are hearing all sorts of positive things about this bill and that there's more support than ever for it and that the police union's poor behavior in opposing it last session is coming back to bite them. And so I'm incredibly optimistic at the moment. I know every time I allow myself that, we're immediately slapped down, so it makes me fearful. <laughs> but at the moment, I feel like that that bill has a great chance to pass. Excellent. All right. Both Texas and the federal government resumed executions this month. Mandy, what's the significance here? You know, really, it's with the federal government. Before this month, the last execution had occurred 17 years ago. And what they did actually was execute three people in a quick clip. And that signals a big policy change at the federal level. Okay, last one. The San Antonio Police Department, which has notoriously had trouble firing bad cops without arbiters reinstating them to the force, finally was able to terminate an officer who once fed dog feces in between two slices of bread to a homeless person. 
They couldn't fire him for that. But another incident of feces-related harassment of a pregnant police colleague finally got him kicked off the force. But almost as soon as he was gone, another cop who repeatedly called a suspect the N-word while handcuffing him was reinstated to the fourth. Scott, why can't San Antonio keep creepy racist jerks off their payroll? It's astonishing. It is absolutely (laughs) astonishing. But the short answer is chapter 143 of the Texas Local Government Code. Mm. Basically, San Antonio is an example the most extreme example we have of the flaws with the state civil service code and giving officers well beyond the benefit of the doubt, but really a leg up in defeating any accusations against them. Mm -hmm. So for example, police officers, if they're accused of misconduct, are specifically allowed to see any video that might have been taken related to the incident and the investigative case file of all the evidence against them before they are interviewed over that misconduct and then they get to come in with their union lawyer. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine anyone else in the world under similar circumstances. You know, imagine someone who allegedly, you know, killed someone or committed well, committed a rape senator then senator ellis had a bill that would um or was in developing a bill that would re- require that someone have those rights that you get to see every bit of evidence against you in a mm-hmm. video before you and your attorney then then yes. talk to investigators well it, it it invites you to craft a story Mm -hmm. that is most likely to get you off and that won't contradict any of the evidence. And so the civil service code is a problem in all the cities that that it operates in. San Antonio has become a caricature of the problem. (laughs) And and to have done so at at this moment means that they're certainly going to be held up as an example Mm -hmm. in the next legislative session. Really, it's it, it's an embarrassment at this point that it's gotten this bad. Seventy percent of officers who they fire get back onto the force. <laughs> That's insane. Seventy percent. All right, we're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. Until then, this is Scott Henson with Just Liberty, and I'm Amanda Marzullo. Goodbye, and thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the Reasonably Suspicious podcast on iTunes or SoundCloud, or listen to it on my blog, Grits for Breakfast. If you listen to our podcast on Google Play, you'll be able to hear it on YouTube Music after you transfer your account, which you should definitely do. We'll be back next month with more and hopefully better news. And until then, keep fighting for criminal justice reform. It's the only way it's going to happen. That's true, his silver hair and eyes are blue Saved Austin from the bomber, that's what the TV said But now he's a chief and if his part's a pity It didn't take long to most of the city Could tell Brad Medley wasn't over his head No confidence, no confidence, no confidence in you The Austin City Council said to the chief with the eyes are blue much in love is certain, but we know this much is true. We got more belief in aliens than confidence in you. On June 12th, the Austin City Council unanimously voted to say they have no confidence in Police Chief Brian Manley's leadership, but the city manager still hasn't fired him. Now, the Austin Justice Coalition needs your help. Visionary change can't happen without visionary leaders. Go to austinjustice.org today to take action. Paid for by the Austin Justice Coalition.